Okay, so I had asked for some written questions because my experience has been more and more that um, when you come to this kind of strong circle of energy, you won't have any questions or not clear questions. So actually, I can only recommend that we'll have another one of these meetings on Saturday afternoon, is it? Saturday afternoon, there'll be like a final sharing. Before that meeting, write any question you have. So there's a very nice question here, which I think many people might be interested to get an answer to. This is from Lisa. What is love and how can I practice love in my daily life? Okay, so this is kind of common misunderstanding. I don't know what she thinks of love is, but love is not something to practice in your daily life. You see, love, amazingly, is your essence. You are love. Your essence is love. It's amazing, shocking. The whole world is looking for love, and they never look for it inside. They're always looking for a new girlfriend or a new boyfriend, a husband or wife, somebody on the outside they can meet at a party, have a couple of dances and, and be in love. <laughs> it's not really love, of course. So your essence is love. It couldn't be any closer. The closest thing is love. And it's not something you practice. You are love. You just be yourself. That's how you practice love, is to be yourself. What is that? This is the, this is the question. Who, what is this self? She's writing it all down. It's been very useful. I charge extra for notebook writing. So this is so beautiful. You have to really never forget this. You know, everybody's talking about love. Everybody wants love. Everybody's getting in their car, and the autobahns are full of people driving backwards and forwards, looking for what? They're all looking for love. Tragic, completely tragic. The whole world's looking for love, singing about love. Lot mostly they sing about lost love, of course, whatever that is. And um, and it's just so sad. It's completely sad because if they would stop looking out there for a new new something, they would discover inside this love. It's worth twenty five years of your life looking for it. I tell you, somehow I've ended up spending sixty years of my life. No, not quite. No, only a bit less than that. 45 years, and I'm not quite that old yet. But, you know, it's a mystery. What is love? I never knew the answer for years. And then you discover your own essence is love, and your own essence is peace. So this is the easiest thing. But and you can't be looking out there for it. You have to look inside for it. And this is something we're completely unfamiliar with. We don't even know what is inside. It's an energy phenomenon. And we don't know anything about energy phenomena. Mm -hmm. And I've talked now to a few of you because it seems for some reason that the people, volunteers who've come this week in particular, you uh, many of you seem to be in a in a, a moment of change, like something is happening, and you're ready for something new in your life. And this is actually very beautiful for a teacher because, of course, unless you're ready for some new something, you're not going to find any new something. And what I can offer, or we can offer here in this community, we can offer you the support and the clarity to come to your own love. It will take a while. Of course, you know it will take a while because you know that most of the time you're, you're here. And you don't know how to get out of there. And how can I get out of here? Because I'm here all the time. It's like a relentless waterfall of thoughts. 
cascading through my brain, or wherever it cascades, you see. And I think many of you have had enough of that. Or maybe you, d you don't really know what happened, but I think I today spoke to two or even three people who basically have got burnout. So the new medical uh, diagnosis, you know, burnout. So what is this burnout? Yeah? Well, burnout is that you're absolutely pissed off with your life. And you should be pissed off with your life because your life is all here. And so I think it's very clear that burnout, burnout or of or whatever, comes from the fact we're far too mental. In the good old days, you know, you would have been living in a village and you would have got on your horse maybe and rode your horse somewhere and met your friend and walked by the river. Or you would have walked down into the village and got the water for the day and carried it back on your head or something. They still do that in some places in the world. But of course, we don't. We turn on a tap and we don't even meet anybody, maybe. So we managed to create a, a kind of uh, structure of life, daily life, of the society, which doesn't really support the basic human need. And the basic human need is, is this love, which is an energy. And I also know that several people here have had a kind of spontaneous moment when you didn't really do anything, but suddenly, for some unknown reason, you felt tremendous expansion. You felt a completely new kind of glow inside you. In fact, you felt this love and peace that I'm mentioning. You didn't know it was love or peace because you always thought love was a kind of relationship with, with a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. Yeah? That was love. So these spontaneous moments that I'm sure many of you have had, this is a very strong clue to a possibility for your life. Because if you can have the spontaneous happening and it brings you into a place inside which feels completely positive, feels completely nourishing and feels okay, very unfamiliar, Maybe it makes you a bit vulnerable because you don't really understand. And now, after many years, you only believe what your mind tells you. So your mind has become your kind of internal judge who decides everything. Is it good? Is it bad? There's John David being angry again. You know, then this lady, one, two, three, three along. She gets very upset immediately because somehow anger isn't okay for her, you see. Okay, she doesn't want to smile or anything. Never mind. So everything is all right, you know. The reality is you're all sitting here and you're all exactly meant to be sitting here. You're exactly in the right place in your life and you couldn't really be doing anything else. So then you can relax, you know. The whole of your life you can relax. It's extremely simple. It's not complicated, you know? I mean, it took me many years to understand what I'm saying. I mean, there was many years when I was busy trying to, you know, something. I was always trying something. Very busy boy trying something. So if you, if you can trust what's been spoken, you can start to to open yourself for trust, to trust in the things that are happening in your life. For example, as, as many of you seem to be in a moment in your life where somehow there's a sort of new chapter, possibly a new book, you know, some, some moment where your old life doesn't really work anymore and you don't quite know what kind of new life you could have. So this is like very vulnerable. It makes you very, very vulnerable. But it's okay to be very vulnerable. You're going to have to be vulnerable if you're going to change your life from A to B. You're bound to be vulnerable.
I mean, it, you look around at this circle of people, there's about 20 people here who basically have chosen to be here and who are ready for some kind of change in their life. What? What is the change going to be? So I would say, I said this to somebody, I think, yesterday. I mean, the first thing you have to decide, are you going to go for the outside or for the inside? Because, unfortunately, if you want to go very far with the inside, it's a real job. And you, you've already been talking probably to some of the residents who've been living here for a few years even. Maybe you can feel they got some value from living here. But also, if you talk deeper to them, they would, I'm sure, tell you that there's many difficult moments and it's not so quick. And year by year, gradually more and more is understood. And that would be my own experience of my life. So if you want to, to really make a, a shift in your life, the first thing you have to get clear is it's not going to work through your mind. That's not going to help you. That's going to help you a little bit. If your mind is connected to an intelligent brain, then that will help you a bit. But fundamentally, it's like a, a whole new kind of calibration of our life. So, of course, in the beginning, it's kind of a bit scary, a bit uh, even a lot scary for some people. A lot scary. I think I've now sp spoken to maybe half of the volunteers this week. And I was saying basically to everybody, you know, if you if you feel touched from this place, because I think almost everybody I spoke to was saying how much love they feel here. So what is this love? Did you fall in love with somebody? I hope not. We have rules against that, actually. You're not allowed to fall in love with a volunteer, you know, because we don't want volunteers getting, getting it too complicated. We'd like you to discover that this love is inside of you. You don't need somebody to give you love. Yes, you can share love with somebody, of course. If they're in their love and you're in your love, then yes, it's very wonderful sharing love together. You only have to watch little kids. I mean, I've got this very strange phenomena where I've got these twins who are dissimilar. So it's like, actually, they're not really twins. I, I've always encouraged them to wear what they like to wear. So they never wear the same clothes. You know, these twins that always go around with the same exactly costume. I mean, oh, horrible, really. But I mean, luckily, they're not twins, twins. They're dissimilar twins, but they're exactly born in the same moment. And they've spent, I don't know, 95% of their eight years of life together. So they're amazingly together, you see. So you observe little children. They're, they're not asking, how can I practice love? They are love. How can I practice my life? Well, just start doing it. You know? Be open. Let, it, let your life uh, develop from moment to moment. Stop resisting. Stop saying no. Dangerous. Scary. Saying yes is much more scary than saying no. Just feel it out for yourself. I mean, Miss Honeybee is our expert in, in no. But I'm telling her this so many times, I think gradually it's uh, disappearing a bit. Maybe you need to ask the others. No, I'm asking you. You see, this is, this is how she says no. She, did you notice? She didn't say no, she said, ask the others, which is exactly no. She's very clever with her nose. <laughs> I think it's got better. Ah. Okay. 
Good. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Maybe we should start having a bit of fun. So think about what you think sitting here is the worst thing that could happen to you. And then I'm going to ask you, like, I'd like to ask this lady. She looks very much like she's connecting to some things she doesn't like. Is that right? right. Okay, well, you can speak German. We have a very expert lady. She's been doing it for 20 years. Can you imagine translating for me? So you speak in German, and she'll translate. Uh, can you explain to her that I'm interested to know in this moment, what is the worst thing that she can feel could happen to her? Well, for example, you're sitting right next to the fire, you might get too hot. Have you thought of that? You're sitting right there. Now, thinking, thinking is all right. I mean, you have to have thoughts, you know. Thinking is fine. We definitely need a mind. We definitely need thoughts. Okay. Well, when you were sitting there, you didn't look as if you were feeling much love. Well, I've just, I can, I don't know you, I've never met you before, but looking at your face, you didn't look like a happy bunny. You looked a bit serious, therefore I ask you this question. Okay. But now it's different. Now you look different. Your eyes are sparkling and your face is different. Can you feel that? That it is different? Okay. When I have shakes, my, my heart, perhaps my heart is a little bit more beating. Yeah, is that all right? Not, um, the last days, I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not used to think about such things. Then I listen out there, even though my last again, it is no use. I, I'm a bit out of practice to think about how I... Okay, good. So is there any volunteer? Because uh, probably half of you don't really want to talk. Do we have any volunteers who, sitting here, are in, can get in touch with what their biggest fear might be? Yeah. I... I think my question is kind of stupid <laughs> that I wrote to you. I haven't got to your and question. Was that your question? No, that was Lisa. No, my question was that I'm... I don't think I've got any questions from you, actually. Oh, yes, I have. Yeah. I can pose it. It says you don't have a question, so I guess I don't have a question from you. Yeah, I said I don't have a question. And do you know why you have fear? Because I spoke to you yesterday, so I know you do have fear. Yes. What is the fear? What are you afraid? I'm afraid of being a laughter. Being a what? Of being laughed, uh, like <laughs> that they laugh at me. Laugh People. at you? Yeah, because I, I'm afraid that people might see that I'm very stupid and silly. And <laughs> just laugh at me and... All right. Okay. And I'll, I'll bet you, I bet, I bet any money that there is many people here, maybe over on this side, looking at you and thinking, oh, well, I'm more stupid than he is. 
some of these guys over here, they're feeling I'm much more stupid than him. You see, so this kind of idea about ourselves, these judgments we have, you know, most of it is just complete rubbish that we were given it by our loving parents or, or loving best friend or something. Yeah? I mean, if you think you're stupid, somebody must have told you that when you were younger and you believed it. But you're not stupid, of course. And when you said about being afraid that people would laugh at you, I had misunderstood the word laugh. I thought you said, I'm afraid of love, you see, because that's the real answer. The real answer is that everybody here absolutely likes to come to love. Everybody, maybe even like this question, what is love and how can I practice love in my daily life? So Lisa is definitely interested about love, yeah? But I'll bet you uh, Lisa is also afraid of love. Most people are scared shitless about love, you see. Why are we scared shitless about love? That's supposed to be what we all want. Aren't all these people driving up and down the motorways looking for love? Are they afraid of love? Of course they're afraid of love. Why are we all afraid of love? Anybody know why we're afraid of love? Yeah, I think it's really scary to be good. Because we don't get to love how we are. Yeah, that's one reason, yeah. We don't get love as we are. It's very common in happy families with loving parents, ha ha ha, that we get love in a kind of transaction. If we do what the parents want us to do, if we behave in the right way, then they love us. And if we do something like, I don't know, make our hair a wrong color or cut all our hair or, I don't know, wear some crazy clothes, then we're not loved anymore because, you know, it's a, it's a transaction. For many people, it's kind of transaction. But that's not the real reason we're afraid of love. We're afraid of love because if you really come to your essence and you really experience love, right, then this doesn't work anymore. This me doesn't work anymore. And I'm completely identified with my me. That's my whole game, you know. I've got years and years of me. That's the only thing I really trust. That's where I always go to get to decide everything. That's 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 what you know. But that has to go if you really want to experience love. You see, so as you start to experience more love, like some of you are experiencing now love here in this house, in contact with the other people, with the contact with the kind of energy that sort of hangs in the house and around the house when you get more and more in contact with that that brings you more in contact with your own love then you can realize that you can't think so much and the spiritual work is is to get rid of not to get rid of the possibility of thinking because you definitely need a mind and you definitely need sometimes to think. But you don't, what you don't need is this massive suitcase of old thoughts, old memories, old stories, old structures that you love to kind of pull out of your suitcase. You know, we're all carrying on our backs this huge box of old. Uh, archived uh, stuff. And we call this box me. Ha, ha, ha. See? So we, of course, we're not going to feel comfortable when this me starts to dissolve, you see. And the closer you get to the, to the authentic love, to your authentic nature, the less you're going to be caught up in this old stories from, your, from the past. So this is actually very shocking. I mean, from the residents who've been living here for some time, they've already been through this 
kind of process. And they're not sitting here very afraid of that. But if you if you are still very new to really looking inside, then it can be very scary to discover that your essence is love, but then you lose this stuff. Mm -hmm. A bit scary. <laughs> okay. So Is it right what I'm saying, or what do you think about that? Atma, Atma has got a very important name, and you know, we should all know she's Atma. Atma is the self. This is the essence. This is the love. This is the peace. Is it nice for you that now maybe for a month you've been living with maybe less thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, we had a we had a wonderful moment actually because she's been in the retreat that I just had in India. It was a three week retreat, and um, as normal with her because she's been here a year or so, she was always resistant. If I would go to her, she would always say no always but she doesn't say no she does it like she did just now she has millions of sophisticated ways of saying no you see but of course i feel the energy so i can feel what she's really doing which was saying no yeah you were in resistance you know much of the retreat mm -hmm. yeah and then a bit of magic happened because on the very last evening of the retreat i invited an indian woman uh, who comes every year to our retreats. And uh, she was answered, she gave a talk. No, she did an interview with me. And then she answered anybody's questions that had been written down like this. Yeah? And the last question, actually, I, I'm cheating, of course, because I always change the questions a bit. So the last question was from, from Atma who was then called uh, Savita. Savita, which is quite a nice name. But she was asking, how can I, well, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was, how can I experience the self? Can you show me the can self you show me now? The self now, right. So after, <laughs> after she got the answer from this woman, um, I was sitting there and uh, I got this idea, a very clear idea. So the next day was the last day of the retreat. And... I gave her a new name, uh, Atma, which means the self, right? And I get the feeling this immediately touched you a lot. Because in a way, it all happened. It wasn't John David's idea. It was just the kind of happening, you yeah? know? It's like you created this situation. You know? And now I feel you're getting the benefits of that situation. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, and... Um... After that day, I got the name. You also told me that you say you deserve it to to change your inner self or something. That you get the na this name and that you are also happy for me or something. I don't really know how, but something I understand. And then after when I'm when I was here, I really um this name really uh, helps me to remember to get into the self and to look more above and yeah, yeah i mean it's... i could i mean i'm very good at seeing energy if you like i don't know if i'm seeing it or feeling it but anyway almost instantaneously on that last evening there was this strong moment for you and you, you visual, visibly were affected by it, I think. So whatever I told you the next day was out of what I'd seen the night before, you know, that you were really touched from all that. Mm. And you kind of needed a shake, you know. And you got existence shake shook you, much better than me shaking you. Yeah. You know? And look at her, she's smiling and laughing and she's kind of happy about all this. So maybe Miss No is changing into something else 
Mm -hmm. She's a, a bit curious if you have a chat with her, because basically for one year now, she's been in resistance. She's been saying no every day for one year. And now it's really beginning to change. Yeah. Do you feel something like vulnerable or strange or a bit scary or something like that? Um, yes, I'm not sure, but yeah, I'm letting something more through me. Right. So I allow um, something more is coming. Is that right? People who, the residents who know her, is that right? What do you reckon? Ah, uh, he's very diplomatic, you see. <laughs> But, but who else has you have contact with yeah. her? you share a room with her even one minute mm -hmm. yeah it changed a lot after india i mean the first two weeks after india were very strong we were very very open and after that i think it settled a little bit but still yeah i feel you're more more there more open to things that are coming and um, yeah so this this name is very beautiful to speak it to see you in it and yeah i was surprised for when i came back i came later than you after the to back and then she was so open we had such a nice contact again and um yeah, just beautiful. It feels very natural, very natural for you mm. to connect to it. Of course, everything you said about her, she could be saying about you. Because you also, well, you were not so resistant as she's been, but still you were not comfortably relaxed and present. You were yeah. often lost in the, what we call the dinosaur past of your life, yeah? Yes. Yeah. And there's also a shift now. Would you say that's true? Do you see that she's also had a shift? So I was very close to India, so I cannot compare to that, but um, before, yeah. Yeah, I, I, there was always something between us. Um, and we wanted to solve it. And then we talked about that. We say, like, what's, what's between? What's going on? And I think that's right now, there's nothing for me. Yeah. So the possibility is that these two girls have come here by chance. They're here in this community, the same community. They're roughly the same age. And there's the possibility of a deep love developing. Not that you do anything for that. You know? As you focus on your own inner world and your own love starts to become more and more available, then you're also going to find that your connection changes and you feel not you're not going to be running around every day feeling love i love her, and her. not like that but the, the deep sense of a deep friendship but on a, on a different kind of level of friendship because you've both chosen to come from whatever your life was and put all your kind of uh, priority into the inner work you know and actually i mean i'm somehow ending up back with these two girls but i mean they're both very young and this is actually fantastic. There's some other young people here. I mean, it's incredible when this happens when you're still very young. Because once you come to your own self, 
once you start to live your life, you know, moment by moment, day by day, and you allow in a kind of deep trust, you allow existence to, to take you on your life journey. Yeah. Then this is so beautiful. And if you've got the whole of your life to experience that, you're so lucky, you see. So Elisa's got another sweet question here, actually. It's the same question, really, but a bit different. How can I be friendly to myself when I'm meditating and thoughts are coming? Ah, kill the thoughts, kill the thoughts. You see, unfortunately or fortunately, we absolutely need a mind and we absolutely need thoughts. So if you need to, uh, tomorrow morning, to book an air ticket, right you definitely need a mind because if you don't have a mind you won't be doing that job very well in fact you won't be doing it at all you'll be lying in bed as a kind of vegetable <laughs> you know we'll come and get you out and i don't know find a job for vegetables but basically you can't function without a mind so you have to be very careful because many spiritual teachers are talking about the mind got to kill the mind or something but if you kill your mind, then as I say, you're going to be not very exciting anymore. So we need a mind, you know, and the more intelligent you've got of a mind, the more that actually supports the inner work. It helps to be intelligent. But there's no, um, there's no exams, you know, there's no exams. Everybody's welcome because the work is to come to your very own self, the self. That's the job, to go from this to the self. And as you become less and less interested in all this old stuff, it's mostly the past. There may be somebody here who's very caught up in the future, but generally it's mostly the past. And we have all kind of dramatic stories from the past. We have you know, maybe dramatic pain inside, emotional pain from the past. So we're very much looking always in the past. And very many of us, we tend to judge this moment now from the past because so many things happened in the past that we've nearly always got a kind of reference to some old kind of archive inside us. And we can then judge what's happening now against this old archive. You see, but even as I speak it, you can see you don't want to live like that, do you? Of course not. You want to live fresh and open and available for what's happening now. It's extremely simple, you see. If we're not careful, we can make spiritual life into something that it's not, because actually it's all very, very simple. It took me many, many years of effort to find out it's simple, but anyway, I can tell you now it's simple, but it doesn't look like that in the beginning. <laughs> ah, here, here's well, I'm gonna, I didn't answer that last question. Well, this thing about being friendly, yeah, being friendly is a bit the same as love, but this is another problem we have as human beings because this mindy computer has got very used to self-judging. We self-judge ourselves really a lot, you see. This is also terrible. It's a terrible sabotage with self-judgment. And of course, these self-judgments started maybe when we were young, and they were not particularly maybe our judgments. They were put there from people who were close to us, who were making these judgments about us. We just collected um, these ideas about us. They became then our, our idea, my idea. And probably if we would go around the circle to each person, we'd find that everybody sitting here 
finds themselves not really okay. My legs are too short, my legs are too long, my legs are too thin, my legs are too fat. I mean, endless, endless. And then when you've dealt with all the physical stuff, then there's like, what's going on inside? You know, am I a heartful person? No, I'm not heartful enough. And it's just endless judging, you see. And the alternative to endless judging is to accept yourself as you are. If you remember in this little meditation, um, the suggestion was you come to whatever's going on and you don't try to change it. It's very simple. Don't try to change it. Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody announced when you arrived that every moment of your life you're going to be happy. You've got to be unhappy in order to be happy. You've got to be sad to feel whatever you've got i mean all these things we have a whole palette of emotions we can use all this palette who says this is not okay and who says that one is not okay so we most of us have grown up with lots of judgments against ourselves the judgments started from other people but we took these judgments on board and we now use those judgments against ourselves. So just imagine if you didn't do that. No judgment, no self-judgment. Do you think you'd become a bad person then? And you're only a good person by controlling yourself through judging yourself? I don't think so. Nobody here looks terrible to me. I don't think anybody's suddenly going to start doing terrible things tomorrow. Maybe Pavasi a bit, but, you know. <laughs> so how do I get in my heart energy from Petra? Petra is your Petra, right? Yeah. No? Your Petra, okay. Did I meet you? I didn't meet you yet. Right, okay. So how do I get in my heart energy? And how do I come to self-love? So just naturally, you know, you can see the, the, the human nature by looking at kindergarten children. You, know? you can see our true nature. Even you can look at a little baby I mean, little babies are like God. It's like being with God. I mean, I still feel that with my my two girls. You know, now they're both asleep, one on top of the other. And when I go in there, you know, in an hour or something, to make sure they, they've got some cover on them and they're okay, you know, they're like two little angels, like two little angels sleeping. It's so touching. Because at night, when they're not talking, they're not doing anything, they're just lying. It's just such a beauty, such a beauty coming from them, such an energy, you see. And we're all like that. And we arrive like that. We're supposed to be like that. And we, we have, for various reasons, lose touch with our, with our true nature, with our self with our love, with our friendliness, with our open heart. I doubt God designed our hearts to be closed. You know? And when we say heart, we are actually talking about the self. We're not talking about our physical heart. We're talking about what you can call the self or you can call it the heart. And this is basically a, a big yes. It's a big yes to each moment of life, being touched by life.
somewhere along my life, I don't really remember now, I, th I don't think it was any one moment, but gradually over some years probably of my own life, I, I discovered that rain is all right. And a lot of heat is all right. Cold water is all right. In fact, all the things I thought weren't all right, I discovered they are actually all right. And that you actually need all those things in order to experience the other things which you think you, you like, like warm water. So I gradually, gradually, without ever realizing what was happening inside me, I think, I gradually found myself coming into a deep acceptance of everything exactly as it is. So if it suddenly rains, well, I'm from England, so actually, uh, you know, for me, rain is like sun for a Spanish, you know. I, I was brought up with it raining, so I have lots of positive emotions to rain. <clears throat> So Marcel is very ashamed because he doesn't have a question. Very ashamed not having a question. And um, what's wrong with him? He wants to know and we should tell him what's wrong with him. What do we think is wrong with Marcel? Can you see any obvious flaws? He's got two legs, two a hand, hasn't got a lot of hair, but he's got lots here, so it makes up. <laughs> I don't know, he looks pretty much complete, doesn't he? Have you seen anything particularly wrong with him? <laughs> Actually, the reality is that, as I'm told by people who meet you during the day, you're very touched from being here, obviously in, in a place that's right for you, and you're obviously already very open because you can easily... Uh, experience what's happening to you here, you know. So actually, is there anything wrong with you? Probably not. A pretty much perfect human being, you know. Not so bad. And when you when you look around the circle at all these funny people sitting here, you look at them all, they're so strange. Look. Look at them all, you see. But actually, everybody's all right, you see. We're made up of millions of strange creatures called human beings. You know? We're all all right. And we're all probably doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we're probably exactly where we're supposed to be. And everything is actually okay. And that's the invitation. The invitation is to say, thank you, yes. Thank you, yes. Uh -huh, okay. Danella, who is Danella? Ah, oh, okay. So she has a question. If you have to make decisions, choices, big or small, how do you differentiate between the mind answer or your true self answer? Okay. So you can be 99% sure that everything comes from your mind. That would be a safe way to deal with it. Okay. And then gradually, gradually, as you open up, you will gradually get a feeling for what is coming from a deeper place and what is coming from old memories. You just get a kind of experience and you just know, oh God, there's my mind again. You see, And, and with the intuition, it often pops up unexpected, you know? You have something to decide and then 
there seems to be no reason, but suddenly you're just completely clear. That's right. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I want. That feels the best. You see. But the mind, if you if you operate in your mind, which probably most people here operate in their mind, and I operated in my mind for 47 years or something, spiritual mind, of course, in my case, yeah, but it was all mind, thoughts, most of it in the past. And, and it's just so different when you're trying, when I think back to my younger time, to the times when I was trying to make a decision about something, you know, it was excruciatingly horrible how I did that. You see, endless kind of good things, not so good things, but all going on in my mind. And I never realized that when I was deciding things like that, I was deciding from the past. And most of it wasn't even my past. Most of it was the past of other people who put it into me. So it seemed then it became my past. But most of it wasn't really my past. Most of it was like my parents' past. You know? So the mind has a very different uh, sense than your own essence. And your own essence is capable, boom, of the answer. The right answer for you, boom, just like that. Like a, a completely instantaneous, um, complete package comes out. And you just know, because it feels very deep inside, that this is the right thing for you. Even if everybody else says it's not, but for you it's the right thing. So this is a very beautiful part of us to develop because it's, gradually becoming like our own navigation. It's like we have a navigation, we have a sort of biological navigation system where we can always get the answer and we follow this answer. It leads to other, other things to open up for us. Sometimes I like to share something about this community, you know, that this community has been running for about 21 years. And I can hardly believe it when I speak it, actually. But in this 21 years, we never had a political drama between two different groups of people or three different groups of people who had different ideas. It's very strange, actually. I'm always amazed that somehow we always come to a kind of consensus. We always come to a kind of, yeah, let's paint it green or something, you know. And this is not so such a small thing because this is the kind of art, the kind of harmony, you know, the kind of harmony. Is it right what I'm saying? Do you reckon it? You've been here many years, yeah? Is it, isn't that roughly true? I never thought about it. You never, she never even thought about it. You see? <laughs> Maybe she didn't want the wall green. Maybe she liked to have a yellow wall. But all the people over here wanted a green wall, so we painted it green. And then she was the only one who wanted yellow. But she doesn't care, you see, because she knows it doesn't really matter. And she knows that, you know, next week we'll paint the other wall yellow or something. And who cares anyway if it's green or yellow? I mean, it's not such a big deal. Okay. So he, Volk, Volkmer over here, he's got a question about souls. Is there something like soulmate, related souls, and how do souls meet again and again? You're not talking about this kind of soul, hmm? 
No, 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 I don't mean shoes. I mean human being. Human beings. Oh, the soul of a human being. Thousands of years, millions of years. Do we keep meeting? Oh, God. Do you think I'm going to meet us all again? We're all going to show up in another house, in another country. You know, we've been going to India for for most of the 21 years. We've been going to India, you know, every January. And always half of the community goes. And um, I think almost everybody from this community, when we get to India, we all feel very, very good, you know. So probably everybody who lives in this community which may include some of you guests, um, probably we all showed up in India sometime in the past. You know? But I personally don't have any memory of that. I don't remember that. But I ask this question because in the Buddhism, for example, or other great masters like Buddha or whatever, they have memories of past. Therefore, I ask this question. Yeah, I mean, the, the Tibetan uh, Buddhist Tibetans are very uh, involved in, in past lives. Yeah? So you probably know that, that before Tibetans leave their body, they somehow arrange where they're going to show up again. Yeah? And if you're important enough, if you're the Dalai Lama, for example, they when when the Dalai Lama leaves his body, they have an, a a number of his personal possessions. They keep these, and then later, if some child is born somewhere, and the people around that child feel something familiar with the previous Dalai Lama, they have a kind of an official group of uh, uh, Buddhists who go with these personal possessions of the Dalai Lama to this maybe little child. And if the little child says, oh, great, that was my pipe. <laughs> then immediately, immediately, you know, all kind of people kind of start taking care of this little child in a different way, maybe. I don't know the details, really. I'm just laughing. But but something like that happens, you know. So, so certainly Tibetan Buddhism believes in uh, life after life, yeah, and how people can come back. I don't know the answer, really. I mean, I have personally a very strong connection with Ramana Mahashi. Yeah. I didn't meet him, but anyway, I have a strong connection to him. And, uh, you know, when he, was, um, he, when he was sick and he was going to leave his body, everybody could feel he's about to go. And um, everybody was very sad and they, you know, didn't want him to go and so on. And then he said to his disciples, where can I go? Where can I go? And I can, I can share that, um, I think most of you know that about two, two years, two, two plus years ago, there was um, put up on Amazon a about a one and a half thousand page book or document uh, manuscript of 
what Ramana Maharshi was talking about in 1936. So for six months, there was a young Indian man, rather well-educated, who'd read many English, classic English books, novels. So he had a very good English. It's old fashioned compared to now, but it's very good English. And observed the goings on of the ashram for six months in 1936. So when I, two years ago, came in contact with this material, it was immediately very touching for me. And I started to um, kind of um, investigate and choose, select what I thought were interesting dialogues. And gradually, gradually, I can say this gradually became more and more clear and strong for me that this is really Ramana's words. It's really Ramana talking. Because working on this material, I could often feel a sort of presence from him. This is, of course, a bit subtle kind of thing to say. But what was interesting is that, in fact, the ashram, the, his own ashram, had decided two years before I saw the material, they were offered the material, and they didn't want to publish the material. So this was a bit interesting because I, I, I talked to some sort of experts, and I talked to the ashram, and offered that we could help them publish this material. And the answer was they didn't want to publish it. They don't trust that it's really genuine Ramana material. Yeah, that was from the official ashram. And for me, I I never really had a doubt. I was never completely sure, but I never had a doubt. And gradually, gradually, since we published a book of selected um, material from the original manuscript, there's been several kind of difficult moments we can say. And I would say every time there was a difficult moment, we had strange things happen, which in a way, if you want to say it like that, felt very much like Ramana Maharshi himself. Yeah. So for example, we didn't really have any proof, but last year we had lunch in the ashram. And as I was leaving the place where we had lunch, they had many photographs on the wall kind of group pictures of Ramana standing or sitting with his disciples. And there was one from 1936, when this man, this young man, had been in the ashram writing this material. Yeah? And when I looked at this photograph, sitting right behind Ramana in the photograph, yeah, right behind his back, was a young man who, to me, looked quite intelligent. And I thought to myself, well, from the way this young man writes his manuscripts, he clearly felt very close to Ramana, and he described sometimes how Ramana was um, apparently very um, open or friendly to hit this young man. You know? So it seemed to me when I saw this group picture and I saw this situation, I felt very strongly that young man could be the guy that we're looking for. This is a kind of proof that that young man maybe wrote this manuscript. Yeah? I told it to the president of the ashram. I asked him, maybe you could check the date of that photograph. Because the young man was only there from July till December. Right? So this year, when we went to have lunch in the ashram, I looked for the same photo. They changed the photo. Ha, ha, ha. So the president, who doesn't want to give any energy to this manuscript, he must have arranged to get a different photograph. No young men in this photograph, all older men standing, looking very kind of different, you know? So I thought, well, why would they want to change the photograph? What are they hiding? Unbelievable. So in this kind of way, I, I got a very close kind of connection to Ramana by doing this uh, book, making these selections.
I could tell many other stories. There are many other sort of strange stories that happened around this project to make the, the book. In fact, they're still going on, actually, because now we're translating the book into other languages. So I can say for myself that actually, you know, what you're asking can be true because I have this experience with, with, uh, with Ramana Mahashi and my own teacher, Papaji. I've done uh, a couple of books involving him. And in one book, I had the whole book finished. And then he showed up and said, put in color pictures right on the end of the book. And in the other book, he also came in and told me to put things into the book I wasn't planning to put in the book. I just spontaneously, you know, from inside me, my intuition told me, do this or do that. And each time it was kind of connected, in one case to Ramana and another case to Papaji. Everybody's going to feel differently about that, what I've just said. But we've got um, Mahima, would you like to share in a kind of shortened version? Because she also had a strong meeting with Ramana some months ago now. Yeah? Okay, so she's lying in bed with her boyfriend and her boyfriend got up and to go to the toilet and more or less in the same moment at the end of her bed you tell me when I could do it too wrong but what he came to the just in front of her in the middle of the bed she saw Ramana Mahesh standing there yeah so she told us this story uh, some time ago and of course it's difficult to talk about such things can you add a few words maybe Yeah, just in this moment, I'm very touched about the story of the Papaji book. Um, so that energy is flowing, but yes, I can, I have a very strong connection to Ramana, actually. I can't really describe where does it come from. But when I was in India, I had the feeling I was already there. And this was very interesting because in a way, he, he led me there. In this night, when I saw him coming up in my room, like a light vision, he told me I should go to Arunachala, to the, to the mountain. And at that time, I didn't have any clue about what's, what's going on at Arunachala. <laughs> 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 yeah and um, then I decided to watch first the film of Arunachan and um, yeah I could really really feel the connection and yes this night was really strange because um, as you already mentioned my boyfriend went to the toilet and I saw this vision coming up <laughs> oh, it was already there, and he woke up and went, went, yeah, this way. And I asked him, "Do you see anything?" And he said, "No." Okay. Then he came back from the toilet, and it was still the same vision, kind of. But I mean, I was awake. I was not dreaming or something because I was really talking with my boyfriend. And I just said, oh, it's a lot going on here right now. <laughs> and then, yeah, he got back into the bed and <laughs> went to sleep. 
um, I don't know, it lasts for maybe had you already, 20 minutes. Had you already decided to come to the retreat? Or was it later you decided? I can't really remember right now. No, it was before. Before I de decided to come. Mm. Nine months before. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, I've heard stories like that from many other people. I mean, Ramana. I mean, there's a famous story of of my teacher Papaji. <clears throat> His family lived in what is now Pakistan, so he was living in Pakistan. And uh, but this story started when. I think he just left the army and he had been traveling around India looking for a guru and didn't find somebody and came back to his family house in Pakistan. And there was a knock on the door. And there was a sadhu. Sadhu is our men who give them, mostly men, who give themselves to God. They wear orange clothes. They live a very simple life. And they beg for their food. And so this man is knocking on the door. <laughs> and when Papaji opened the door, he was begging for food. And then Papaji gave him some food and then asked him, do you know anybody who can show me God? And this was his question when he went around India. He went to all kind of famous gurus, asking them, can you show me God? And he was not satisfied by anybody. So then uh, he, he was very interested in this idea of going to see Ramana Maharshi in South India. This sadhu said, he can definitely show you God. So um, this, just a quick part of the story. He got a job in Shanai. And after some time, he came to this little town with this mountain, Aranachal Mountain. He came to Ramana to, to see Ramana. <clears throat> he came into the hall where Ramana was sitting. And after a moment or two, he got very angry and went out again. So somebody came out and said, what's the matter? What's the matter? And he said, ah, oh, that man sitting in there saying he's Ramana Maharshi, he's a, he's a fraud. Because recently I was in Pakistan in my family house and he came and knocked on my door and he told me to come here. So that's an even better story than her story. So the, these, with Ramana Maharshi, I mean, there's a lot of stories with a lot of people who have some kind of vision. So that may be helping to answer your question. And I think, in a way, one of the most important things of thinking about this question is that probably life doesn't work the way you've been told it works so however you've been told it works is probably not true and it actually works in another way which maybe nobody really understands yeah you agree yeah yeah good Do we still have some observers? Nine, Nine observers. Oh, very good. You could ask them if they have a good question. You, yes, well, who am I asking? I don't even know who's watching. You ask them. <laughs> hey, guys, any good questions? All asleep by now. <laughs> you have a question, okay. Um, last time when we had the contact, you told me are you still working? You still working from your conditioning. You are German and you're so precise. No? And so I'm running around now with the question: Can you ever get rid of this? conditioning, like you are in India, or you're English, or Australian, because it's very strong when you grow up with all the things. Right. And uh, 
yeah, how it would be to unlearn this, actually, uh, to be so well, precise I think, or be... I think this is like a very that. fair question because, you know, I think I've got a very strong kind of English enough about me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Is that true? <laughs> I mean, I quite like being English, and I still, I still occasionally watch the BBC. You know, <laughs> just one part and, of it. And and when the when they when the Queen died, you know, I watched the whole story. <laughs> and when the king, when they now made a new king, you know, I watch all that stuff too. You know, I have one eye glued, you know, to the. I mean, not that strongly, but yes, I'm I'm very much English. I doubt it's ever going to change. You know. And this also, I came to this conclusion, but I thought I will ask. I, mean, I will ask you. Uh... I mean, one good, one good, one good thing I can say about myself is that it's very rare for me to say sorry. Because if you go to England, you know, everybody's constantly saying sorry, sorry. I remember once years ago going on going to the office in the morning in a very crowded train, you know, metro train. And there was a big guy standing, and I stood on his foot, very strong, you know, like bang. And he said to me, sorry. <laughs> as if he, you know, had his foot there, though. He, you know, it's his fault that I stood on his foot. So England, if you go to England, everybody's constantly saying, sorry, 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 sorry for me being, you know. I don't think I do that very much anymore. So there have been some small improvements. But I think uh, we don't lose some of our conditioning like that very easily. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I thought if you're an Indian person, uh, you cannot really uh, leave it. The same like a German person. Or is it so so strong or so maybe also right that it is like this? No? What well, the I difference is? I had lived in Australia for five years. And then I had a, an Australian wife. And it, during that sort of period of my life, people asked me if I'm Australian. So my accent got a bit different from English, I think. So I could have become an Australian, but Australians and English are not so different. But I mean, even though I had a Japanese wife, I never became Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> You're also the Spanish people we know and, and the Russian people, no? right? Ukraine, they have, when you see them, because we have contact with so different ones, Ukrainian or so, the, but, but something is the same. No? And the Ukrainian or the Spanish people or the German. Hmm. And also, it's not only bad, no? it's also interesting or alive or how it's called, variation. No? It's a variation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the part of being French or German or Japanese or Indian or Russian, you know, very distinctly different cultures, I mean, it's not really essential because still, you know, the self, the Japanese self and the French self and the German self and the Russian self and the English self, it's all the same self. But the personality of a Russian or... A yeah. German or a Japanese, the, the, the personality is different because, because of the conditioning and the culture and the influences as we grow up, definitely different. But this is not the most essential part of any human being, I think. Very interesting how Germans are so open to to even raise the question that like you're a very good girl, you know, that you're considering that you want to drop your your identity of being a German. But I guess it's also like there's nothing wrong with being a German, even though it's quite interesting because when I went on travels, I could see that there's lots of different opinions about Germans, and we have this history of you know being the Nazis and being very bad, and we still have that. I mean, you know. So it's like there's there's such a deep rooted also shame in this identity, which which then also creates kind of a stuckness probably in the German identity, like a shame that we we want to we are open you know we are open to change, 
<laughs> you better. More like, must manage. Yeah, must manage or something. Yeah. You know, like this. But nothing. Anything else? What do you, what are you feeling right now, actually? Uh, I and mean, she's looking a bit too happy. Yeah, what do you think? Are you feeling pretty good right now, or not? Right now, a bit tired. Right now, a bit tired. Today, everything went very quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, two days ago um, there was so much energy through my body and um, one um, one longer time before before the afternoon workflow started um, there was like very much energy flowing and I couldn't move and um I was very strange movement moving and um when when I open up for this what is happening then it get got more and more um and then fear came because whoa this is not this is very strange then got again less but then I surrendered again mm, and um, before I felt very like on drugs um, yeah there was like a meeting with Mahima and it, it felt uh, yeah I don't know it's really crazy Mm. So, away from it was very far away from I do know this, I do know this, I do know this. It was yeah, this is now coming and this is now coming and Oh, this, oh. <laughs> it's so new <clears throat> so many new things going through and I see new so new things yeah Anything else? Seit ich da bin, okay, weiß ich nicht mehr, wer ich bin. Since I'm here, since one week, I don't know who I am anymore. It's just all the same. It's all the same. Everything is different. Except yeah. I don't have any concept anymore. Mm. It's a tiny switch to the other. In party, this feels very well. A tiny thing works to Unsicher, sehr unsicher. And the other part feels very insecure. That's so genial. <laughs> we lost the <our> translation. <laughs> yeah. so Probably she's now talking to a Spanish guest who wants to stay in our guest house in Spain. 
So when you live in this community, you're always going to have more than one thing to do at any one time. Soll ich weitersprechen? Well, he's going to transfer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also, ja, alle Konzepte, wie ich so Menschen begegnet bin, als es eine Selbstverständlichkeit ist, so concepts of how we meet people, they disappear. How we what? How we would meet people, other people, they disappear. Like patterns, the mass, the other way, the other way, the selfverständlich. That's what selfverständlich was, was ein Ich, wenn ich anderen spricht wie, ich weiß es nicht. So the things that normally an I would talk to a different I, is normally kind of things that are parallel or so on, so we can see that it's not what we have. And that doesn't happen here when he meets people. Anstrengend. Hm. Quite exhausting. Also, mm -hmm. noch viel mehr Schlaf so, oder Ruhe, still. Need much more sleep or just quiet time. Um. And I would say that living in this community is quite intense. Because somehow, you know, we, we live a lot. In fact, you know, maybe new people, when they come here, they go out for a walk in the park. But people who live here regularly, they almost never go out to the park because whatever they're doing is so absorbing, so intensive. I think that's true for most of the people living here. So if you're a guest coming here, you might think, oh, I like more nature. I'd like to go out more. I pity there is not a, well, actually there is a lake where you can swim in the village, but you know, you might have ideas, you know? But actually um, all, all these kind of normal things, they all fade away, actually. It's very interesting. You see, however strongly you feel, oh, I, I, I need that, or I need that, or, I must have this, these things all sort of disappear. We we don't give any energy to it. And uh, gradually, these things tend to disappear. And they're replaced by such a sort of nourishment, you could say, like nourishment, being, being feeling inside completely nourished. Um, uh, uh, something like a big yes happens, you know, a big yes. It's big yes. Yeah. Ja, so die Reflexe, die ich sonst so drauf habe, so was weiß ich, ja. irgendein Gefühl und ich esse es weg. Such reflexes, for example, when there's an emotion and I would eat it away. Oder ich will aufs Handy schauen oder das geht jenes. Or that I would watch my phone. Das funktioniert nicht. These things don't work anymore. I mean, I, I was touched from Atma, actually. I mean, in a way, when she was telling us, I felt that's a good moment to stop the meeting because actually um, what she's describing, in a way, is, is what happens here. You could say something like that. And you're interesting, too, because you've only been here one week, so you have a kind of fresher look, maybe. Yeah. And you're basically confirming somehow what she's saying. Yeah. But you don't really need to understand it. No. <laughs> you either you, you like it or you don't like it, you know, but you don't need to understand it. Even that I can judge really. What? I can't really judge that. Right. It's good or not, I don't know. It's a, I, have I also don't know. 
the church. I mean, it's, it's always been difficult for me, you know, because I'm English. I don't really want to live in Germany, actually. All my conditioning, I used to, well, I won't tell you what I used to do. But anyway, um, yes, yeah, there's nothing inside John David that's choosing to live in Germany. You know? I mean, I quite like the, well, I, the, there's many things I like, actually, but there's many things I don't really like. So so it's not my choice at all. You know? But I don't care about that choice, you know, because I'm here. Mm -hmm. I can't leave. It's impossible. And um, I don't know. It's just my destiny doesn't let me leave. See, And I don't feel I'm living in Germany anyway, because... With these wonderful people who chose to come and live here with me, we've created, you know, our own little place. You know, the Vatican has its own little country in Italy, and we've got the Open Sky House in Germany. It's our own, uh, whatever. Yes, it's, we have our own culture here. You know, it's, it's, it's the same by me. Uh, I'm here, and it feels totally right to be here. When I go outside, so they need hike and uh, fire, and so it's not a strange, it's strange, real strange. But here, when I'm going, I'm not the right place, I'm at home. You know, sometimes it's very good to be innocent, you know, because 21 years ago, a couple of women brought me here one night, you know, they said, Oh, we found this great house, you have to come and have a look. So I came to have a look. And I looked up that way and I saw these lights, you know. I thought, wow, there's a fun fair. And then I looked that way and I saw the lights that way. And I said, wow, there's two fun fairs. The house is between two fun fairs, you know. And I thought, wow, perfect place for us, you see. This wasn't fun fairs. This was. Of something else. I don't know. Okay, so we're going to stop in a minute. Any last question?